Hey, how's it going everyone? So for today, I'm going to uh, be diagnosing and repairing a coolant leak on this 2006 Toyota Avalon. Uh, it has a fairly aggressive leak. Uh, if I pressurize the system up with a coolant pressure tester. So right here I have this system under about 16 PSI of pressure and it's losing pressure at a very, very quick rate. Uh, this is an indication that the, it has a pretty major coolant leak. A uh, large enough leak to where it's going to leave a puddle on the ground so why I have a, a catch can down there. The leak, I can start to see some coolant down on the bottom of the radiator there. So we'll lift it up and uh, take a look. Alright, so with the car in the air, we can see rural common leak on just about any vehicle with a uh, plastic tank radiator. The uh, plastic tank uh, seam where it meets the aluminum core uh, has a leak. This is really really common. It, it doesn't really discriminate against any make or model Most manufacturers have these plastic tank radiators installed on vehicles. Uh, so this is really common where uh, Where the uh, tank seam meets it's glued together. There's a there's a crimp along the uh, length of the radiator there that uh, is glued together and that that's a real easy spot to Spot to leak especially when you get some high mileage. This car's got well over 230,000 miles on it. Uh, so what we need to do now is we're going to need to uh, drain the radiator by uh, loosening up the uh, pep cock right there and uh, collecting the fluid. We already have the radiator cap off so that'll make the fluid drain nice and easy. We'll have to remove the two transmission cooler lines which are right there. Uh, and then this being a luxury car we do need to take our time to make sure that we uh, very nicely take off the duct tape that's uh, holding the under tray on. Uh, this car does have a lot of miles on it and it has been uh, fairly used and abused So we're gonna try to get the under tray back together the way it was But I don't think I can do as nice a job with the black spray painted gaff tape that was chrome So we'll see what I can do. All right, so we got the uh, radiator drain. It sounds like someone painted a bucket unfortunately uh, We'll let this uh, drain all the way that way when we take our uh, little radiator hose off from here we don't run the risk of uh, making a giant mess. Uh, we also need to disconnect the two transmission cooler lines, which looking at our new radiator already has the hard lines installed. So we'll just have to transfer over the hoses. This is always a good opportunity too, to double check and make sure that these hoses aren't leaking because now is a good time to change them since they're coming off. Uh, I also like to drain the radiator fully before I disconnect these. That way there's no risk of uh, coolant getting into the transmission fluid at all. So we'll uh, let the cooling system drain, take the lower radiators off to get the last little bit of the coolant out, and then disconnect these two hoses and we can go from up top to remove the radiator. So I find the best tool to remove these uh, coolant line spring clamps is gonna be a remote style spring clamp pliers. Uh, these are real nice because you can use the uh, end to be far away from your hand Compress the, compress the spring clamp, and then that way you, uh, you don't run the risk of uh, wrecking your hand if it springs back. So we'll just slide up, that up out of the way. And we'll remove our lower hose. Trying to direct the coolant into our drain catch, catch can to not make as big a mess. All right, so from here, we can remove our two trans cooler lines. Uh, same thing, they got spring clamps on them, so we'll just use spring clamp pliers to remove them. Uh, I also, too, like to use just a, a random bolt to fit inside of the hose to try to mitigate as much of the uh, trans fluid being lost as possible. That way there's less we're gonna have to top up. There's gonna be, you know, around a quart, quart and a, or half a quart that's gonna be lost just inside of the cooler. We can't really do much about that, so we'll have to make sure we top off the trans fluid, but this way we won't, we won't be draining it out of the cooler lines. All right, at this point, uh, we have the car back down uh, ground level to work on. I've already removed this uh, plastic cover shield, which Toyota uses to block where the uh, radiator cap is. So I already had that removed to uh, properly pressure test this. So the next step in removing this radiator is gonna remove this air inlet for the air box. We're gonna remove the uh, radiator top cowl 
that should expose the radiator for us and we'll have the electric fans to remove and the AC condenser up front as well as the upper radiator hose on this side and the uh, radiator overflow tank hose. So we'll get removing those and then we should be able to pop this radiator out. So with the air inlet out, I now have uh, access to the top portion of the radiator cowl that unbolts from the body of the vehicle. I need to make sure to take note that the hood latch bolts to this and that possibly has a uh, adjustment to it for the striker of the hood. This particular vehicle has a support rod going down to the subframe so that will stay in place and that's not really an issue on this particular vehicle but it may be on one that you're working on. You do need to take care to pull out all the wiring clips for the electric fan so that you don't damage the clips and it goes back together. Be careful with the AC condenser and be as gentle as possible when removing the radiator from the vehicle. All right, with our old radiator on our right side and our new radiator on the left side, we're gonna transfer over a couple components. Uh, this is also a good time to make sure that everything matches up. The radiator hoses go where they need to go, so on and so forth. The cooling fan on these, they just kind of snap into place. There are these little uh, pull tabs or push tabs, I should say. And then you lift up on that and there's there's two others that we got to get and then they just kind of lock into these base this is really pretty common on all cars now for whatever reason manufacturers are having the uh fans be like a rector set uh model where you just snap it all together uh the other thing to note too is these rubber isolators so these often get stuck into the bottom of the radiator or in the cowl so this radiator when i pulled it out this one stayed in but this side stayed put uh, that's really important to make sure that we transfer these over. This is what the radiator kind of rides on. Uh, the radiator itself actually isn't bolted in. It has rubber isolators on top that uh, kind of lock it into place between the top radiator cowl up here, which is this guy, and uh, the bottom of the radiator cowl with these rubber isolators. So it just kind of floats around. So it's really important to make sure we put these back in. Uh, it's also really important to go through and clean up any coolant or transmission fluid that's leaked down onto there during the removal. Now we were able to fish the radiator out without degassing the AC system, which is kind of nice, uh, but we do need to be very careful when we put the new radiator back in that we don't ding the condenser or cause any more damage. With the radiator out, you can kind of get a better view of the leak that it had. Uh, this is the bottom side of the radiator, so we're looking at it upside down. But you can see it was, it's been leaking coolant for quite a while. The uh, core itself of the radiator is fairly uh, plugged up in the sense that the, the fins are pretty dirty. So this radiator probably wasn't very efficient as it, as it was. Uh, so uh, this replacement radiator will be um, a welcome change and hopefully we'll have a little bit cooler uh, engine temperatures while we're driving. So being as gentle as possible, you drop the radiator and fan assembly and down into the vehicle, uh, trying to get the uh, little rubber isolators into their uh, bores taking time to bolt the AC condenser up and trying to get everything back together, the reverse that you took it apart. It's usually a little bit easier to get it put back together than it was to take it apart because you already know where everything goes. So one of the important things to note if you're reusing these uh, spring clamps is they will put an indentation in the hose where they uh, once were living. For these to accurately clamp down on the hose, it's important that it goes back in almost the exact same position. So once you get the hose on, you go through with the hose pliers and you do your best to get it to the exact position that it came off on. That way it's clamping the hose um, as tight as it possibly could be. So you just try to line it up with the groove that it once was in. and give it a release. All right, so we got everything wrapped up down below. Radiator hoses are all on. Transmission cooler lines are all back on. All the air ducting's back, back together. Uh, this is, you know, kind of an average radiator to put in in a vehicle. The process is kind of the same no matter what kind of car you have. Uh, this Toyota Avalon was actually really nice to work on. Uh, the only thing that was difficult was my mistake as I broke the uh, bolt off for the battery hold downs. So that required me to drill and extract that and find a new uh, uh, M6 by 10 bolt to put in, uh, which wasn't that big a deal, and that was my own fault. It wasn't wasn't anything of the vehicle's fault. Uh, so the next step and the last step ultimately is we're going to uh, bleed our cooling system. Now 
this system doesn't have a bleeder on the on the engine that I can find at least. Uh, I haven't referred to service information, but I do have access to this vacuum bleeder. What this is going to do is this is going to put the cooling system under a vacuum and then we're able to draw in coolant when I open the one-way valve. I really like using these for a couple reasons. The first reason is as long as uh, the vehicle doesn't have too crazy of a cooling system where the heater core is way higher than the, the engine or anything along those lines, uh, it gets all of the air out of the system pretty accurately. It also too is kind of a uh, quality control check. So when I add air to this and I pressure or I, I pull a vacuum on the system, it's able to uh, hold, if it holds pressure, holds vacuum, I should say, uh, then I know that I don't have any other leaks. So this is kind of the tell of like, okay, the, the hoses are sealed up and everything's nice and uh, ready to go. So there's a red portion of the gauge and a green portion of the gauge. Essentially, once we get to the green portion of the gauge, um, we are pulled to enough vacuum to where we can now draw in the coolant. Uh, the key with that is we do have to have a container uh, filled with enough coolant to fill the system up. Usually you want to have more coolant than necessary. That way that this system doesn't uh, draw dry uh, when it's drying in the coolant. So what we'll do now is we'll uh, create a vacuum in the system and then that will allow us to draw the coolant in. A couple things to note though, for this to accurately work, we do have to have the uh, drain tube going to the overflow bottle uh, blocked off. So the system does have to be perfectly sealed. If we don't have that plugged off, then uh, we run the risk of uh, not being able to build up of enough of a vacuum. So we'll use our shop air to draw a vacuum and then uh, any residual coolant I have directed into the overflow bottle uh, if, if we're able to suck any out. So at this point, we've created enough of a vacuum. We're going to block off our system. So this will hold the vacuum inside of the cooling system and release our air supply. And then we're able to remove the vacuum line and then put the feed line in. So we're going to attach the feed line to the tool and then this is going to go in our reservoir filled with coolant. It's usually a good idea to pre-prime these to fill them up with coolant and then uh, and then attach them. So with the valve open up, we're able to uh, fill the cooling system up. You can't really see it, but the uh, upper radiator hose and the lower radiator hose for that matter collapse down because of the vacuum that's been uh, forced into there. So a good tell that the uh, system is completely filled with coolant is when those hoses relax and go back to a, a normal shape. Uh, the gauge will also go down to zero, but as we get closer down and we reduce our vacuum and we're filling it up with more coolant, uh, it does take a little bit longer. All right, so at this point, my gauge is down to zero. The hoses are uh, normal shape, so I can close the valve off to not create a mess. Drain the new coolant into the uh, reservoir, and uh, we're essentially ready to go. I've noticed it's a good idea when you take the adapter off to add a little bit more coolant to the radiator. Uh, you don't need very much. This had a pretty substantial leak, so our overflow bottle is uh, completely dry as well, so we'll add coolant to that. Uh, from there, we'll then be able to add the cover that completely covers this guy, and uh, we'll test drive the vehicle. All right, so we have the vehicle up to operating temperature. Uh, one of the tricks to tell if your cooling system is fully blood is if the heater's hot on the straight vents, which it does appear to be. Um, other than our maintenance required light and the low washer fluid level, I uh, went for a test drive and everything's uh, nice and ready to go. So the last steps would be to uh, clean everything up. We need to also make sure that we're properly recycling our coolant. Uh, you can look at your you know local registrations on where to find a uh, recycling center. Uh, and then other than that, just get the vehicle back on the road. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch the video and I will see you in the next one.